how we deal with death and grief is a question that changes not just through time but from culture to culture. Um, almost no two cultures deal with such things exactly the same. And um, well, when you're around it as much as I am through my role and my calling, you, you see an enormous amount of a variety of responses to it. And I think one of the questions if we're trying to follow God as well, does he give any, us any resources for dealing with death, any kind of guidance or uh, stewardship of how we could handle it well, g given that it's an inevitability um, and a fact of life? And I think he does. And as I was studying this passage this week, I found that the two parts of the chapter maybe sit a little uncomfortably together if you see what I mean, because you have uh, first this sort of quite strange tale of the Amalekite who runs with the crown and tells the news and then he pays with his life. Um, and then you have David's deep lament and I wasn't immediately able to see the connection between them, but I think there is. I think they're put there by the author so that we can see a couple of variety, a bit of variety in a response to death and um, draw the, the, the appropriate lessons from that. Since we were with David the last time, where uh, he was on the run and where he had that incident with Nabal, he has continued to be on the run. He's actually in the intervening chapter, she's been siding with the Philistines, if you like, as a survival mechanism. Saul has continued to pursue him, but Saul has been on a downward spiral. Um, you know, when Sometimes you, in, in our culture, you find celebrities and they were once great, they uh, were beautiful and they were brilliant at their craft and then you get a picture of them much later on and perhaps the, you know, the drink and the drugs has got to them or, um, but they've, they're off the rails and, and you can't recognize them uh, compared to their former selves. Saul had become like this. He had felt that God had completely abandoned him and he was not making good decisions. He was rudderless to the point where he eventually falls in battle um, and he's lost all his connection to God. And it's, it's, it's really sad to read. And we might think, because we know that David's been anointed as the next king, we might think that David is just waiting for that to jump in and get his turn. That's not the case at all. There's, there's a, a beautiful lesson in the way David handles death. So I'm going to look at, chronologically, um, this little vignette with the Amalekite and um, how the Amalekite responds to Saul, the king's death. And then we're going to look at how David does it. This Amalekite, after the death of Saul, he comes and he fell on the ground to pay David honor. And this is his words. This is what he said. The men fled from the battle. Many of them fell and died. And Saul and his son Jonathan are, de are dead. And David asks, well, how did that happen? Because he wasn't there. And the young man says, I happened to be on Mount Gilboa. And there was Saul leaning on a spear with the chariots and their drivers in hot pursuit. And he turned and saw me. And he asked me, who are you? And I said, an Amalekite. Then he said, stand here and kill me. I'm in the throes of death, but I'm still alive. So I stood beside him and I killed him. So he actually looks quite noble in that version of events. Because at the end of the day, he's putting a very, uh, he's putting a fatally wounded man out of his misery. Could be seen as an act of mercy. But I love how the Bible does this. This isn't the only record that we have of Saul's death. Saul was wounded critically, okay, but in the end of 1 Samuel, chapter 31, it says that the fighting grew fiercer around Saul. When the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. So that's the Philistines. Saul said to his armor bearer, who would have been one of his own people, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come run me through and abuse me. So it's that classic war situation of he does not want to be captured by the enemy. Death is better than that because of what they'll do to him. But the armor bearer was terrified and wouldn't do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. And when the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on a sword and died with him. Just the most tragic of ends. Now, some commentators have worked hard to reconcile these two accounts. Some have said, well, the Amalekite came round later on and even though it looked like Saul was dead, he actually wasn't. The Amalekite helped him finish the job. 
I think that's plausible, okay. But I think there's clues in this text that that's not the whole story at all. Because look at the way the Amalekite presents it. Verse 10. So I stood beside him and I killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. And I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. So you can see he's got a penchant for massaging the story. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's making himself look quite good in it because he doesn't want to, obviously, he knows it's, it's no mean thing to do away with someone's life. So he says, well, he couldn't have survived anyway. So, you know, it was really the merciful thing to do is the way he puts it. And then what made him think that it was his place? You know, when you think of uh, an ancient culture and ceremony and uh, the amount of people who have a specific role, you know, Saul had all his armor bearers. He had um, a court. He had the Levites who were in charge of the institutional and religious and civil. You know, th- what makes this guy think he's got the right to pick up that crown and, and take it to David? He's, he's taking a lot into his own hands. Let me put to you that these details are recorded in the text because the Amalekite is actually a bit of an opportunist. Almost certainly was one of those folks that you would see lying, uh, running around a battlefield looking for the spoils of war. A looter. So he's got the royal crown that Saul had. He's managed to loot it. And then halfway through going to it, thinks, well, you know, David's going, no, he'll have known fine well. The Amalekites were a neighboring people. He'll have known all about David and how um, revered and powerful and and accomplished he was. And he thought, well, well, how am I going to survive in that administration? Right, okay. I'll make up a pretty good story. Um, I'll say that I'll ingratiate myself by saying I helped it's all out of his misery. And also, you know, here's the crown. I've done you a favor by bringing it to you. So he's massaged the details. He's probably a looter who's very gifted at spinning a story. And it's so timeless the way these stories are presented in the Bible because these kinds of things happen over and over again. And sometimes you see people around the time of um, death or even crisis or serious illness and they show up out of nowhere and they come charging into your or my life uh, with not only wishing to be there and be in the midst of it and to quote unquote help, but might also pledge undying loyalty. And I couldn't help having seen this, especially around death. Um, you've got another kind of person who the body's not even cold and all they want to talk about is who's getting the rings or how the estate's going to be carved up. And I'm seeing so many nodding heads. You've all seen this. And I think it's given for our wisdom because David doesn't always shine gloriously in the text or in the stories, okay? But he does, when when he's at his best, he has good judgment and he's able to discern when somebody is a bit fly and at it, which I think this Amalekite is. And I think the application for us is, having learned this the hard way myself, is beware of those who come flying in, especially at times of crisis, and want to really help and save, and might even pledge their undying loyalty very quickly after you've just got to know them. Because there might be something else that they're actually after. And also, You know, his story isn't actually able to stand up. David charges him with, you should have known that that was God's anointed. He basically says to him, stop trying to massage the story. You know, and in a sense, we can understand that from being human. We do try and maybe, if we've been caught out, try and change the details a wee bit to make ourselves look a bit better in it. But it would have been far better if he'd just been honest. I don't know that he would have lived, but it's always the best policy rather than trying to say, well, you know, minimize it. It wasn't that bad, and that's not really what I meant. Is go, no, no, okay, repentance. Right, I'm turning around, I'm, I'm acknowledging this. And David, I love the way David does it. He reacts for, if you like, God's honor and glory. Because Saul had given him a hard time. Saul had chased him out of house and home and lied about him and all of that. But look at the way David responds 
He's saying, why did you do that to the Lord's anointed? David took that so seriously. And in a sense, you know, it didn't matter who was in that role. David had concluded that for whatever reason that was known to God, Saul was God's pick at this point in time in history and not David right now. And he decided, I need to honor that. And he did that out of his love for God. And it's possible for us to do the same thing. We might not like how God has ordered events around us in our lives, but it is possible to honor him. It is possible to honor those he's put around us. It is possible to honor by praying for them are politicians and political leaders and those who make huge decisions and those who lead different parts of the church, even though we may disagree vehemently. It's possible to do all of that because we're doing it out of an honor for God, even if not for the person, although I think David does actually show Saul an enormous amount of honor given how he'd been chased. But David, David doesn't treat Saul the way Saul had treated him. David doesn't treat Saul as he deserved. And the inflection of the gospel here is that he really nicely reflects the way God approaches and sees us. Many of us have offended God many times in our lives, perhaps even already today a few times. And the, the thing that we need to cling on to in the gospel is, as David puts it in one of his psalms, he does not treat us as our sins deserve. His mercy and his ability to overlook our faults is eternal, is immeasurable, is able to cover our worst faults, our greatest self-loathing, our darkest regrets, because he does not treat us as our sins deserve. And then we come to David's lament for Saul and Jonathan. And uh, so this is a piece of Hebrew poetry, which is all over the Old Testament, particularly in the Psalms. and, And something that's worth knowing, and I don't want to try and make this like a higher English lesson, but it felt like that when I was studying it. But Hebrew poetry is very um, terse. It uh, uses short, sharp sentences and images to get an idea across. And it's lovely. It's a really nice form of literature. But uh, this little poem, this lament is no different. David begins it by saying a gazelle, and I'll just pick out a couple of details that I think are relevant to show us how David is responding to this tragedy. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel, how the mighty have fallen. Now, there's a really nice bit of wordplay at the opening of it. When he says a gazelle, uh, which we know is a sort of mountain leaping animal, the, the word in Hebrew for gazelle is almost interchangeable with glory. And it's as though there's ambiguity there that's trying to make us see that uh, the very glory of Israel is now falling down and is is in jeopardy because they don't know what the fate of the nation is going to be now that the king is slain. It's one of the most dramatic things you can do is to topple a leader. Um, In the early days of the Ukrainian war, there were every other day, it seemed there were assassination attempts on President Zelensky because Putin knew that if he could take him out, the morale would probably collapse across the fighting forces. The glory, if you like, or the gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel. How the mighty have fallen. And how the mighty have fallen has made its way, of course, into our vernacular because it's, it's just a brilliant way to express our, often our bemusement and dismay at how events can change quickly. He's putting together the idea of the glory of Israel and what God is doing, being at the the heights, at the pinnacle and the unapproachable heights of a mountain. And then in the next sentence, crashing down to the very bottom, because that's how we feel the fortunes of the nations have gone. He uses a gazelle because that shows how quickly it's happened, because it's a very, uh, it's a speedy animal. For there, the shield, I'm down at verse 21, of the shield of the mighty was despised, the shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. Now I'm picking that out because 
it's, oh, it's so nice the way this is arranged. In the previous part, David had said, you should not have killed the Lord's anointed. And then he uses an image in this elegy or this lament that is bound up with anointing. You see, um, the idea of oil in the Old Testament is quite often associated with anointing. And anointing is just setting someone apart for the work of God. And that's seen as a sacred thing. Um, when our current monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, was anointed, as she still is, because she's the head of the Church of England as well as of the nation, it was the only part of the ceremony that was shielded from the BBC's cameras because it was seen as so sacred that it was not for the gaze of anyone. It was almost between her, the um, priests administering it, and God. And that idea runs all the way through to the texts we're reading today in the Old Testament, that this is the work of God, and it's for him to do, and it's symbolic of his, his choice, of the way he's using leaders to work in the world. And really nicely, I just love the way David does this, the shield in these days would have been made of leather, and they would have quite often been dressed with oil in order to keep them su supple, but also slightly reflective for being able to bounce mat other materials off them, such as projectiles. So he's using that image to pull together the idea of what's happened to the anointing. The oil that we're meant to think of anointing that was on his shield has now been replaced by the blood and the dirt of war. And it's a, you know, it's a way of processing his shock and his grief because it's almost unthinkable, but the one who ruled and who was set apart by God is, is, is now lying and becoming the dust of the earth and the, what should have been anointing oil is now being replaced with these horrible materials and that happens in an instant because of the savagery and the unpredictability of war. That has all happened so quickly, and David is struggling to process it, as we all often do at times of death, because the quickness of it, uh, nobody ever seems prepared for that or able to deal with it all that well. Lament and being able to express this is so important. I think David is using his gifts as a poet, as a leader, as somebody who's good with words and artistic, to give voice to national mourning, to give voice to how tragedy has struck them and their future is now uncertain because they're being pressed in on every side and their leader has been toppled. And it's something that other cultures probably do better than ours is, is that sense of, of lament and grief. And indeed, it's something I've lamented in recent times that um, in our culture, death is much more sanitized and more clinical. Um, often the worst parts of it are, are hidden from us. And that, in some ways, is comforting. But what that can do psychologically is give us the effect of not grieving to the same depth or even going through the entire process because we're being so shielded. Um, and if you look around like other cultures today, uh, particularly the Middle East, they're still very expressive in their lament. They're, they still have it as a big part of their culture, pros and cons. But I was reminded this week as I was studying this, that uh, in particularly in Gaelic culture, which I grew up in, they're very strong on this. There are, there's a whole genre of, of Gaelic poems and songs um, dedicated to lament. Uh, one of my favorite ones comes from the 1500s, uh, the clan chief of uh, MacGregor, who was Gregor, the Red MacGregor, um, he was in a feud with the Campbells, and he actually ended up being executed by the clan chief of the Campbells um, very publicly um, in front of everyone that knew him and loved him. And his wife had not only a small child at the time in 1570, but also an unborn child on the way. I think she was about eight months pregnant. She wrote this beautiful uh, Gaelic lament for him and uh, as a lullaby to her children called Grigol Kriya. Although nobody would sing it um, today as a lullaby if they knew the words. But in the last verse of that, it's got a similar kind of starkness about the horror of how death can come so suddenly as this. Nur wis nahen noch nach Kattel, Chef nach Socker, Sangwisch mische Brichger liege, Erto 
Buolik Moga Wife. Tonight, when the young women of the town are sound and safe asleep, I'll be lying across your grave, beating both my hands. Um, it's that sense of despair and the fact that we don't actually know what to do, but we have to give voice and expression to it. And you know what's quite surprising, if you like, about this lament that David has? It doesn't actually mention God in it. Now, David is the, the man of, of the Psalms. David wrote a great many of them. David mentions that God is his rock, his refuge, his fortress, the one whom he hides in, but he doesn't hear. And there's a time for everything. This gives us expression and permission at times to be so by, bewildered by grief and death that even if we have faith and we know God, that we're not sure where he is at that time. And maybe we're not that great at praying through that situation. And we have permission for that because God knows that we are dust. And God knows that it's actually important at times to do what David has done. At this time, he speaks about the people that he's lost and he loves. It's a very nice paradigm for the fact that we say eulogies at funerals. He speaks to Saul and Jonathan, which is a completely normal response to grief. It would seem that he's not sure where his faith is at this time. Which again, you know, we can be very stiff upper lip and think, oh well, you know, God works all things together for good. Well, maybe you're not sure how that is going to happen right now, and that's okay. But also, just, and this is the final thing, it gives us a paradigm for how important lament is. And it is perfectly in a world that is so marred by the fall and death and sin, it is perfectly right and appropriate and even in, to be encouraged to go through that process of lament to grief for what is not there. And it is a process, and David shows us how to start it by just sitting with the facts of the shock, of the surprise, of whatever the particular circumstances are, of not being afraid to sit with that, and also of being assured that whatever emotions that gives us and whatever that makes us feel in regards to God, grief, anger, bewilderment, despair, confusion, his perceived absence, that he is able to handle that. Because you see, David moves on from this and he continues to write some of his finest poetry about God. He just doesn't have to that day. And you don't have to on your worst day be anything other than what you are because God is able to handle us on our worst days as well as our best. May he bless his word to us this morning. Amen.